Good afternoon, everyone. Before starting, we're going to show a short message from our sponsors. Muy buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Antes de comenzar, vamos a mostrar unos pequeños mensajes de nuestros auspiciadores. con el objetivo de disminuir la carga viral. Dentide, expertos en salud bucal. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this new webinar organized by Education Office, Faculty of Dentistry, Universidad Finisterra. Today, our international guest will reflect on whether dental caries as a disease can therefore be prevented and, exam and examine the role of fluorides in controlling dental caries, inviting us to reflect and think critically about dental caries disease and how we approach it. We welcome to Professor Oli Feyerskov. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing your reflections about this important topic. Also, we want to thank the supporting of our sponsors, Dentide, Oral-B, Panaceo, WebDental, Medbooks, Dental Depot, Express Dent GC, and KCL Dental Society. During the webinar, shut and microphones will, will be disabled, but don't worry because you will have the opportunity to ask Professor Feyeskov and solve your doubts after finishing his presentation. Thank you very much. And now, Dr. Diego Hasanovic will introduce to our amazing guest. Doctor? Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm just gonna say a few messages in Spanish beforehand. Um, for our Spanish-speaking audience. Um, bienvenidos a todas y a todos a este webinar, que es realmente un webinar excepcional. Es uh, nuestro 60 webinar y además en Chile el Día de los Profesores, a quienes felicitamos muy cariñosamente desde ya. Como comentó el doctor García, 
los micrófonos van a permanecer cerrados hasta que eh, tengamos la ronda de preguntas tras la presentación del profesor Feierstoff. I would like to welcome you all and also introduce you to the team. We are a very small team in a country virtually at the end of the world, Chile. Um, and together with Dr. Esperanza Villasante and Dr. Nicholas um, Garcia Santos, we have put 60 webinars so far. This is our 60th um, on a very special day because we have a very special guest. And also in Chile, it's Teacher's Day. So, wow, what a hat trick for everyone. And we would like to send our warm wishes to all teachers around the world uh, and beyond. Um, we are very excited. We invite you all to follow our social networks and uh, follow us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, we have um, an email address. Should you wish to um, write to us, please feel free to, um, to do so. And as my colleague was mentioning, we would like to thank so much from the bottom of our hearts to all our sponsors, um, the Dental Society at you know, my university, King's College London, the Scientific Society of Students, Anaseo, here in Chile, Oral-B, Dentaid, our friends at GC, at Express Dent, Dental Depot, Medbooks, and of course, Web Dental. A very, very, very warm, um, you know, salutation and greetings to all of you. And this is the kickstart of a series that we are going to launch to talk about minimum intervention and cariology. And we've got Professor Franken coming over via Zoom on the 7th of November, and also Professor Avijit Banerjee joining us on the 11th of November. So, you know, maybe take a screenshot, an opportunity, uh, two opportunities not to be missed. So there you go. So here's what you guys came here for. So I have the honor to introduce, and I'm not going to read his very, very long um, CV, but I have the honor of introducing Professor Oli Feyerskov, who will be, you know, making us think, who will be talking from his experience as well and from his wisdom. And now we are going to um, let him speak for us. We are going to um, activate his microphone, Nicolas, and maybe you would like to also um, load uh, professor's, Professor Feyerskov's um, presentation. So enjoy. We're going to activate the microphone. So? Great, we can hear you loud and clear, Oli. Welcome <laughs> to your first Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say this is um, a somewhat bizarre um, situation, uh, simply for me, simply uh, because usually um, I am not um, liking to speak out in the distance without seeing the audience. Uh, the problem is, uh, if I can't see the reaction of the audience, uh, my presentation tend to be terribly boring. And as you can see, um, I am not the youngest generation. I'm actually an old gnome from um, Denmark, high north, uh, absolutely opposite to uh, Chile. I shall do my utmost, uh, however, to keep you awake, I hope. And it, rather than talking about um, an ordinary webinar, I uh, like to see this as 
some reflections on the theme carries cannot be prevented but controlled because um, what I'm going to do is actually to assume that those of you who are interested uh, in the details uh, behind what I'm trying to express today uh, please have a look at the uh, textbooks uh, which uh, I have produced uh, together with colleagues and friends uh, and at the end of the uh, reflections today um, I will give a couple of references uh, on papers where uh, Professor Dalin and Manji and I in two uh, different publications in recent years have um, tried to address the two major oral diseases from a point of view which probably would uh, stir up quite a lot uh, of the way in which you have been used to think in terms of etiology and pathogenesis of carriers and periodontal diseases. Uh, but it's highly relevant for the situation we are finding ourselves in um, first of all, let me, um, if uh, we see the next slide, please, uh, have a look at it. Uh, that's where I'm usually um, belonging to the um, uh, city of, of Aarhus, um, uh, the, and the next one as well. Uh, the next slide, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Actually, in the background here, you are having uh, our Faculty of Technology, uh, the white building uh, of the harbour. Uh, and if we take the next slide, you will see the university or part of it, please, Nicholas. Now, yeah, let's jump. It's, um, yes, this from the uh, university. Um, and what I would address today, because I'm sitting, as you can see, uh, in a very relaxed mo mood, because I'm not in Aarhus, I'm not at the university right now. I'm sitting far out of the West Coast, close to the North Sea uh, uh, of um, Denmark, uh, in a 200 years old farmhouse, so uh, bear over with me uh, if um, I am behaving maybe too relaxed. But uh, I will perform the reflections from uh, here. Let's have a look at the uh, next slide, please, Nicholas. Uh, yes. Um, you see, I want to share with you um, a mail correspondence I had a week ago with one of our colleagues, a very close friend of mine from Colombia, uh, Gloria Escobar. And, and uh, in the discussions we had, she wrote um, this sentence, that this moment is an uh, opportunity to claim for a more biological and social approach to control the two most prevalent all diseases. We need to reorient our practice towards primary care and um, action impacting daily practices where people live, study and work as the pandemic showed the limitations of traditional services to cope with people's need in crisis like this. This was actually what uh, also had turned me on for the reflections today, namely that when the COVID uh, pandemic hit the world, it was apparent that suddenly dentistry as a profession found itself in major problems, simply because the uh, 
respiratory droplets don't obey our social distancing. And that means um, we as a profession suddenly appeared extremely vulnerable to um, this pandemic uh, because there's no doubt that dentistry, in my opinion, will not be the same again, although the profession at this moment in time hopes so. I don't think it will ever return to what we would call normality. And I'm going to explain to you why. I see the uh, changes which suddenly were forced upon us because of this pandemic as a unique chance to actually transform the dental profession at this moment in time once we move out of the uh, present situation because the biological dimension behind the major all diseases are actually uh, of a character as I will try briefly to reflect on today and show you in the references at the end of a nature which would allow us to truly do a totally different approach to the way in which we are controlling the two most prevalent all diseases. Like it or not, um, if you saw the um, situation in, in um, if, if I may have the uh, following slide, I think, Nicholas, as far as I recall it. Um, nah, yeah, it's just those of you who may be interested in um, the details of the books. Let's get this away, Nicholas. Thank you. Yes, um, this is from um, a sh short political statement in, in uh, um, the American Dental Association's uh, uh, journal, JADA, uh, in, from 2016. And I think this is interesting because although I don't think that the US is a particularly good example on a healthy uh, medical and dental system, it nevertheless is the country which all of us usually refer to as a sort of standard ever since the Second World War. However, have in mind when, when considering data coming out from the US that it's the most expensive healthcare system in the world and they are having a very bad control as you have seen recently of the uh, COVID pandemic. They are unable to cope with it. Uh, and, and this reflects a very weak healthcare system, in my opinion. Now I've been uh, critical, but uh, let's return to these days. Good Lord, what happened? Can you still hear me? Good. Um, gosh, good. No, the reason for showing you, and I promise not to show much more of these um, slides, uh, this graph is that those in the US who can afford it, that probably meaning about half of the population to see a dentist regularly, what is actually happening in the dental office? is that the dentists are spending about 50% of their time, the red columns, doing diagnostics. 
then they are having um, a green bar, which is restorative activities, and then what they call prevention, whatever that is, are the blue columns. In other words, is this really what requires a five to six year training at university level? Or does this reflect that all disease, at least amongst those who are most well off in, in the society of US, has reached a level where it can be coped with in a much cheaper and maybe better way. I think you should have this in mind. If you are moving around the globe, um, I think we are seeing a very strange pattern in uh, Chile and most of South America, in fact. We are seeing a massive overproduction of dentists and still the need of all healthcare in the population is not at all met. That was precisely what Gloria Escobar was pointing to in her sentence namely the social need in the populations. If you look at other places on earth, uh, India, Thailand, etc., it's a similar situation like the one you're finding yourself in in Chile. It's an overproduction, massive overproduction of dentists who are actually doing more or less what you are seeing here from the American slide is my claim. If you then move to the very north of Europe, to the Nordic countries, uh, it's apparent now that we have virtually caries and periodontal diseases totally under control, also periodontal diseases, like it or not. And for that reason alone, time has come. That's at least, as I see it, the positive side of the COVID pandemic to truly reflect on if we are providing the right care the right, yeah, all healthcare to the entire population, irrespective of which society you come from. Um, and what I'm going to focus on today is the biological dimension of, of uh, these claims, namely, my claim is today that I think we know sufficient about both dental carriers and periodontal diseases to truly, from a public point of view, give better care and define which type of health care, all health care, is needed for the entire population, not only for those who can afford it, but it's so striking that uh, in the last week, it's apparent that um, the dental profession, at least in the US, is fighting to return to normality. They are delighted they can now open up again, uh, being totally protected, uh, of course, um, both the personnel in the clinics and trying to protect the patients from uh, infectious uh, material. <clears throat> but nevertheless, um, I would question whether we would ever return to the fact that we are going to drill and fill 
like we did before. Even if you look at this slide, you will notice that uh, there is only about, in the US today, about uh, an average of 12 to 13 percent of the activity in, in the clinic which is occupied by restorative care. The rest is not. So we are in fact at a situation where we have to look at ourselves as a profession and ask the question, do we provide the right oral health care? And are we doing it at the most qualified way and as cheap as is possible? I noticed when being in Chile last time that, uh, and I, some of you, I apologize, may uh, remember that I showed a picture of um, a lovely looking girl I met in the street having a big poster in front of her saying cosmetic dentistry is the answer. Go to the next clinic or second line orthodontics, third line implants. Is this really the way the profession thinks is meeting the need for healthcare in society? In my opinion, it is not. It is remains of how dentistry developed and where we come from. And that was why I early on said, I think time has come that we should take advantage of the situation we find ourselves in globally and address the question now, do we do it? the right way, looking into the future. Um, in order to, to look at the um, situation as, as we are finding ourselves in, uh, I think we have to, to look backwards for a moment. Actually, uh, what has characterized dentistry uh, up to the end of the previous century was a sort of inevitable need for restorations, either new restorations or in those countries where there were enough dentists or even too many dentists, repair uh, of existing uh, fillings. Uh, and when these broke down, etc., then maybe you were to continue into endodontics, etc. The question is, this is not protecting the, the um, dentition. This is not prolonging the life of the dentition to such an extent that we can promise our patients that they will have a natural functional dentition lifelong. And as some of you may remember uh, from some of the lectures I gave in Chile recently, um, that was my message then. And to me today, it's even been more um, important than ever. So um, if we remember by the middle of the previous century, once we got the air rotor introduced into dentistry, suddenly this madness of drilling and filling exploded all over the world. We found ourselves in a lovely position. We could really go for it. I remember when I came to um, a dental school in the middle of the previous century, uh, as I said, I'm pretty old, um, then it was apparent that we all entered with a lot of restorations 
despite we were only about 18 to 20 years old. And, and hardly had we come to the dental school before we all enrolled as patients for older students who were going to learn how to drill, fill, repair, etc. So that automatically shaped our way of seeing dentistry, thinking dentistry. And, and that is what I wish to address now to say, please, maybe we actually have come to a point where we know so well how to cope and control the diseases. I don't think we can prevent them, but we can control them, and I'll argue my case soon. Um, so that alone, combined with the fact that COVID is going to be around for at least one or two more years in its present form, I'm afraid, uh, vaccines or not, before we are having vaccines uh, produced which are safe and efficient, uh, I think we uh, also have to get it uh, widely spread globally and that will last long. So don't dream, in my opinion, of returning to a normal dental life. Let's together rather rethink how do we provide better oral health care for the entire populations we are serving, not only for those who can afford. And the answer, in my opinion, does not lie in cosmetic dentistry <clears throat> or refined restorative care, because that should be uh, virtually uh, unnecessary in the foreseeable and near future, at least in part of the world. Now, um, the way we have been recording dental care is, which is the um, all disease which is most responsible for the need of restorative care uh, has been that we have always been thinking in terms of restorations in the way we diagnose dental caries. Not only the classical uh, DMF uh, scoring system, but also the much more complicated ICDAS is basically nothing but a way to look for caries lesions and decide what sort of treatment should we provide? Rather than asking the question, this patient, is that condition which that patient is finding itself in, able to be controlled in such a way that we can promise the patient that assuming so and so, you can keep your teeth for life. We have basically relied on that we should just replace fillings. Next time the patient comes in for six months or a year's recall, we go for uh, re-restoration, et cetera, et cetera. We keep it nice and claim this is a sort of prevention. Now, what is dental care is reason, uh, really? Dental care is, is a result of what's going on in the dental biofilm on two surfaces. And we know now that what cause care is to develop is an imbalance in the physiological balance in that biofilm. We are brought up believing that the biofilm is 
uh, a damaging thing. It's uh, creating pH drops, and these pH drops ooh, uh, uh, is the end of the life of the tooth. No, it's a normal physiological phenomenon that if you feed microorganisms in the oral cavity, whether being on the dorsum of the tongue or on a tooth surface, you are having metabolic activities which reflect itself, amongst other things, as pH fluctuations. It's constantly going up and down and up and down. It's not only like we all know the Stefan curve from the good old days, you get a certain amount of sugar in the mouth and then goes pH down. Yes, it does, but constantly throughout every moment, every day, there are fluctuations in pH and you can influence the strength of these fluctuations by an unhealthy behavior, eating too much sugar. Um, and, and that's actually what matters. So, therefore, what we are looking at is not a matter of when can we record a lesion at the stage which calls for restoration. That's the way we are normally recording caries. We rather should constantly, whenever seeing a patient, look for the various degrees of examples of caries undergoing development in the mouth and decide what does this patient require in terms of methods and modalities to actually control further progress of the lesions. Even if you are having uh, cavities, if these are accessible to mechanical treatment uh, with a fluoride toothpaste, then you can leave it there. It may cosmetically not be, depending on where you are finding it, um, very nice, but from a survival point of view of the tooth, this is possible today. We can do it, but it means there's no magic trick by which you can give a certain agent, call it X, and then if you drink that or put it in a varnish or do something with it, then you are preventing disease. No, you are influencing the rate by which further damage or early damage is taking place. But unless you are constantly instructing patients lifelong in how the individual patient best can control, control his or hers own situation, then you are not doing a proper job. You could say, ah, but that's prevention. No, mentally, in our heads, prevention means that you do something which then prevents something from happening, hopefully forever. And we know today the way both caries and periodontal disease develops, it's not a one shot only. You could argue, ah, come on, fluoride, that's the answer to the solution. Fluoride prevents uh, dental caries. I'll make it very short now because we are uh, to come to the question and answer uh, part. But fluorides do not prevent dental caries. In contrast, 
to what has been claimed so often. All that is based on the old established knowledge uh, which derived from, in particular, the US, namely that adding fluoride to water supplies meant that in cross-sectional studies, you saw fewer cavities in those who were living in a fluoride, water fluoride area than those living in a low fluoride area. But you were rarely asking the question, how does it look like lifelong? The only thing this showed was, we now know, that fluoride interferes with the ongoing pH fluctuations in such a way that it change when being present in the oral cavity, not in the tooth. It doesn't prevent anything by sitting in the appetite, but it has to be available in the oral fluids at slightly elevated concentrations to influence the degree of saturation with respect to calcium phosphates in saliva and in the oral fluids. If fluoride is slightly elevated, it, you can actually have a situation which, and that's what most people have, in which you can get a slight loss of calcium out of the tooth surface, while at the same time, deposit a fluoridated appetite in the surface of the enamel. You all remember from uh, your uh, textbooks or what you learned at dental schools that dental caries develops as a subsurface lesion. That surface is not because the surface enamel contained more fluoride. It's because the reason why the surface contains more fluoride is simply that it's incorporated because of the constant fluctuations in pH. So at least we now know that fluoride acts not by strengthening the teeth, not by providing more resistant teeth, as we were told when I was a student. No, it, it, and it delays, it slows down the rate of dissolution when the metabolic activity in the biofilm is going on daily, monthly, annually, lifelong. So if you are influencing these processes, you can actually control dental caries. And that's why I prefer strongly to talk about control of dental caries rather than prevention, because it mentally, in the dentist's head, also creates a uh, a sort of thinking. If you are saying to the dentist, you are controlling, you are telling the patient how to control further mineral loss and progression of the disease, then it, the patient hopefully will understand, and the dentist definitely should understand, that that's why it's important that the patient is constantly met by someone in society who is trained to tell them how to control dental caries and periodontal diseases. Um, and uh, as you can hear without saying too much, I think that maybe we should consider to use or train other types of caters and dramatically reduce the number of dentists in the future in order to make it 
costly and uh, much better ways of controlling uh, all diseases. So I think we are actually at a point you could say, ah, uh, now uh, this is an old man thinking that uh, he's going to bless the whole thing and he can go on. No, what I'm trying to say if, is, if you apply present day's knowledge into daily life in order to create a situation where you serve the need for healthcare in all populations, then you have to select other ways of organizing dentistry than the ones we are presently having. And we are at a certain part of the world now come beyond this point and we have, at least in, in the part of the world where I come from now, to take action on this. There is no longer the need for having so much expenditures going on to train highly specialized people who actually are trained to do what you see on this graph I'm showing you right now. You could say, but we can be used in healthcare in general. That's where the COVID situation has been frightening also from the professional point of view. In how many countries have we seen the dental profession being used to assist the general healthcare system in testing, in helping to provide appropriate diagnosis and treatment in very few, if any, countries have we seen this. Quite in contrast, dentists have been exposed, for example, in Denmark and in most other countries I know of, in such a way that the health professions, the other health professions, have not even turned towards the dentists and said, ah, please come and help us uh, in the test tents, in the test centers, come and help us in, in doing uh, a variety of activities during the COVID um, situation. No, they have simply just said, you don't um, have to go to the dentist. In the US, 90% of all dental visits disappeared when the COVID pandemic started to explode. And to the best of my knowledge, the dentists didn't find alternative ways. Well, they did all sorts of tricks to maintain uh, a certain function for the last 10 percent those in need those who had acute situations and fine we need that but the question is uh, if it's the right way we have been doing it so to end this part of of uh, my reflections i would say rethink based on the biology we today know about caries and periodontal diseases. If we are providing the right quality of care and the right time of care needed for our populations. I think uh, before you may actually all be sleeping out there, but um, I'm, I'm still alive as you can see uh, for the time being. So. Um, let me please uh, see the um, final slide, Nicholas. Um, yes, the references I am, those of you who may be interested in, the, in this, uh, having this much more uh, substantiated, 
please uh, go and look um, at uh, the recent paper we published on al uh, alternative perspective on periodontal diseases in uh, BMC, uh, all health. And uh, some of you may know uh, when we had the paper in CARES research in 2018 on CARES and periodontal uh, diseases contesting the conventional wisdom on their etiology. There you can read uh, a more scientific uh, documented background for the way in which we are thinking. And then I've added just um, this uh, last reference on Kuai, uh, I don't know actually how to pronounce that name. Um, so excuse me, colleague, um, but uh, Dr. Guai uh, has published uh, in um, uh, JADA uh, a paper in 2016 uh, where he reflected on where is dentistry going and that's where I took the uh, slide I've had standing uh, while I've been talking on what is actually happening in private practice in the US. So uh, I ought to have started by saying hola uh, but uh, <laughs> I, I totally forgot to do that uh, but now uh, Thank you so much for being prepared to listen to um, my reflections and uh, do not hesitate to uh, address uh, questions and I shall see if I can uh, answer in a proper fashion, uh, at least I can otherwise um, provoke uh, some discussion, I hope. So thank you very much for being prepared to listen today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Did I say it right? Mm, mm. <laughs> Much okay. better than my Spanish. I've been practicing my Danish, so there we go. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity after your thought-provoking uh, presentation uh, to also thank a lot of members of the audience, particularly we've got the presence of our Dean, Dr. Alarcon, who is sending his warmest wishes all the way to Denmark and some members of staff. We have also some colleagues whom you've already met the opportunity both, you know, elsewhere and in Chile, um, all the students. I'm sure, no doubt, they'll be asking questions. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're getting ready to ask you questions in the Q&A session. And also, I would like to say a very warm welcome to a future dental colleague, um, Nima Kazampour. He is the president-elect of the Dent Student Dental Society from King's London, who's joining us as well, and with whose society we've had a tremendous support. Hi, Nima. Uh, we'll be seeing you um, in, in future webinars as well. Um, so Nicholas is going to explain to you guys, um, you know, how we're going to be functioning during the Q&A in Spanish, and I'll be doing the English bit. Before I um, pass on the mic to um, Dr. Garcia, I would, I'm going to post in the chat a link to a raffle that we are hosting uh, with some interesting prizes. Um, obviously, um, shipping is not included, Nima, so um, obviously, you know, you'll have to be, uh, you know, forking out a few quid um, if you are uh, the winner, but by all means, do participate. It's in the chat as well. We've got first prize, an electronic, um, electric toothbrush, um, courtesy of Dentaid. Um, second prize, we've got a 45,000 um, uh, pesos, which is about 45 uh, quid, uh, 45 pounds um, uh, vouchers for spending on medical books and uh, 30,000 Chilean pesos voucher for medical books courtesy of Medbooks Chile. And fourth prize, an amazing kit um, from Oral-B Expert, the new line and also a blood pressure monitor. Nico. Muchas gracias, doctor. Así es, vamos a comenzar con la parte final, que son las preguntas y respuestas 
preguntas que ustedes pueden realizar a nuestro tremendo invitado que acaba de realizar una increíble presentación. ¿Cómo poder realizar sus preguntas? Pueden solicitar el micrófono para que puedan preguntar directamente al profesor Oli Feierskopf. Para hacerlo deben presionar el icono de participantes que figura en la parte baja de su pantalla de la plataforma Zoom. Se va a desplegar una ventana donde figura la opción levantar mano y nosotros veremos en nuestra ventana de participantes quién está solicitando la palabra y activaremos su micrófono para que pueda realizar su pregunta. Thank you very much, um, Nicholas, and um, I'll explain briefly. I'll try to be as uh, efficient as Nicholas. Um, if you go on and if you go and click on the participants uh, button, um, you'll see a menu, and then next to your name, you can actually click on a, a little button that displays several options, and then one of them is raise your hand. I can see some blue hands, white over blue hands already raised for questions. And I've already posted in the chat a link where you can download a PDF with all the references um, that uh, Professor Feyerskop was very kindly alluding to. So let's start a Q&A session. I, I'm going to um, let our colleague, Dr. Jackaman, Rodrigo Jackaman from University of Talca. I know he's been waiting for this. He was also um, a special guest at our um, September discussion panel on cariology. So let's activate Dr. Jackamans Nico um, microphone and um, let's start the um, the question the Q and A session. Uh, hi, Oli. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So. Well, I hope everything is going well there. And it was very good to see the pictures of Opus. We were there with a colleague a couple of years ago, but you weren't there by the time. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for this provocative talk, as usual, which is very good. And I think we need in dentistry a little bit more time to reflect to do more philosophy rather than restorations. And I totally agree with I uh, think we're living in special times, and I think these times uh, offer a window of opportunity for the profession to move forward. And uh, I think it would be a very huge mistake that after this pandemic, we come back to normal and we keep doing the same things all over again. So in that, I couldn't agree more with you. Uh, I also agree with the concept that caries cannot be prevented, especially using fluoride, because the mechanism, the biology behind the use of fluoride isn't in the causative uh, path of, of caries. And, and then, of course, what you do with fluoride is just to uh, stop the progression of the lesions instead of uh, preventing the onset of the disease. But that, uh, although I agree with you, there is a problem that I would like you to uh, discuss on, which is the, how we convey this concept to the community. How do we say to the community that caries is not prevented the way we canonically think of prevention in, in dentistry? Because uh, the message I think it's also important in order to have a good strategy in, in to decrease the prevalence of the disease. So if you could comment and discuss about this, it would be very good for us to, to supplement what you already said. Thank, thank you. you very much. Again. No, thank you, Rodrigo. Good to see you again. And um, I would be happy to do that. Um, I fully agree with you that that is the challenge which we as a profession is having. Namely, firstly, the profession itself should appreciate uh, this particular way of seeing the all diseases and understand what is meant by saying that the all diseases can be controlled but not prevented once and for all. 
because then it is possible for the profession, hopefully, to understand that, of course, we should see dental caries not as a disease of childhood only, but something which is going on lifelong and therefore has to be influenced, brackets, controlled, lifelong. Um, then the second and equally important is how to bring that message across to the patients, the, to the population at large. Um, firstly, I think that all the patients we get into the dental offices has to be told that we can treat them in a classical way, but if they are not following our advice on how to control further lesion development and progression of lesions in the oral cavity, then they themselves are responsible for what is not uh, putting the blame on the shoulders of the patient, but saying to them, all right, I've now done what I can do. Telling them the patient, we do not have a magic product or agent which we can give you either on the teeth or as a pill or a mouthwatch or whatever, and then we have prevented the situation. All we can do is we can help in reducing the rate by which the oral diseases progress with age. And therefore, I entirely agree with you that we are facing a challenge which is a, a twofold challenge, namely to get the new dentists and the dentists already in operation in our society to appreciate uh, the situation which I showed you, namely, actually, what are they spending their time on? Is this healthcare or is it, let me provoke, is it money making? in order to earn their daily living. And that's fair enough. The way we have structured and organized our healthcare system, dentists have to earn their living from what they are producing. And therefore the challenge we as a profession is meeting is enormous, in my opinion. Uh, it's very big because it requires a total new way of thinking the profession in the future. So it's not a here and now a black and white shift in activity. It's a matter of actually asking ourselves, should we change the way in which we train people students for being all healthcare workers, whatever you call them. How do we do it best possible? And what do we do in the 20, 30 years from now on to that is in operation? How do we adapt in a running fashion the existing dental profession to meet the challenges of the future. I think we can do it, but it requires a very coordinated strategy in any society to overcome this challenge. So I'm not saying it's going to be easy.
Uh, I was purposely, as you know, Rodrigo, very well provoking in order to push the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Rodrigo. I don't know, maybe let's activate Rodrigo's microphone in case he wants to um, reply. No, you're happy. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy uh, and I think, uh, Oli, that we should uh, probably spend more time with uh, Chilean wine discussing all these topics next time you come to the country. Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> Rest assured that next time you come here, you will have the best of the wines that you can experience from this part of the world. But yeah, so we need to make sure that we have a vaccine soon. Huh? <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> we'll Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Um, I see a couple of hands up. We've got Diana Nanut also. Um, I don't know if I pronounced the, the surname correctly. Let's activate her microphone. Diana. Hello. Hello, Diana. Hello. Can you hear me? Loud. Yes, I hear you. I hear you loud and... Oh, yeah. and... Thank you. Eh, hablo en español mejor. Muchísimas felicitaciones al doctor. Eh, justamente es lo que yo pienso de prevenir más que curar. Y yo a todos los niños a partir de los seis años hago selladores. Sí o sí, en todos los dientes y topicación con flúor una vez por año. ¿Cuál es su opinión acerca de los selladores, de hacer selladores a todos los niños? Ok, Diana, voy a traducirlo, pero dame un poquitito porque mi memoria, mi, mi capacidad de, de gigabytes es un poco limitada, pero voy a hacerlo de a poquito. And Oli, um, Diana is asking in Spanish, so I'll, 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 I'll translate into English. First of all, congratulating you on a thought-provoking presentation. And she is very much of the thought of, um, obviously, prevention, um, and particularly in children in her practice. And she mentions that she does um, perform um, fissure sealants on, um, Diana, dijiste, todos los niños? Niños y adultos, diente sano que hay en boca, lo sé yo para prevenir futuras lesiones. Okay, she mentions that she is of the idea of um, fish sealing virtually everything, every teeth, on whether it's adults or children. Um, and obviously, la pregunta es, Diana? ¿Qué opina de sellar los surcos? And what, para what, prevenir a futuro, futuras lesiones. Okay, and what's your opinion, Oli, on sealing all fissures um, to prevent future lesions? Um, thank you very much for the question, Diana. Um, don't get my answer wrong, um, but should I make a comparison to what you suggest, then it corresponds to when I was a young dentist and we were told by our department of prostodontics, start out doing full crowns on all teeth in the permanent dentition because then you will have no more carious problems. In other words, I think fissure sealing uh, is relevant for those who may be in particular in need and not able to perform a proper occlusion uh, cleaning themselves, but it's not a useful um, mass control way. It's expensive and it's, it's, uh, it's just postponing the whole situation. We have, in contrast, to teach children 
at any age to understand the need for what they can do themselves or their parents. And let's face it, I think that in children, like it or not, in order to get a sufficient care control, we require that the caring person in the family, being the mother or father or grandparents or whatever, should take responsibility for the all health care of the children from early on in life and keep it on until they enter adolescence. Thank you, Oli. Thank you very much for your question. And we have um, Iraldo um, Pesaresi, I think from Peru. He's uh, contacting us. We've been corresponding. Iraldo, welcome. Hello. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, oh, good, good afternoon. This, the sun is going down right now here. <laughs> good after midday, Professor. Ah, Danish. <laughs> I, I, I actually speak a little more Dutch, but I just one piece of appreciation and thanking you for your amazing conferences was mind blowing for me and from some colleagues with Mexico that we were talking about. My question will be in this world where the Hughes company of cabs doesn't belong one single car, where the company of hotels don't own a single room. Do you see a future possible with dental offices without a chair? You know, talking about education, how to eat healthier uh, without the dental chair, the dental handpiece that we are so traditionally uh, trained to use, as you once said, as you once said uh, that we are overtrained to do what we do, but undertrained to do what we need to do. Precisely, very correctly expressed. Um, uh, yeah, but I think that this function or this type of cater, um, what I would ca call an all health cater, uh, should be widely distributed amongst people in society and does not require, uh, uh, so to say, clinical setting, but rather require uh, to be mobile and circulate from family to family or in, in certain districts and call for uh, children and their caring adults to give instructions, suggestions, listen to questions. It's a, it's a massive um, change in health care concept, which we are seeing presently coming also in medicine. Namely, that uh, other caters take care of the disease controlling activities while uh, a treatment um, modality is being concentrated in relation to smaller healthcare uh, stations, hospitals, etc. Uh, I do not, I think that uh, it requires a restructuring of our profession, as I said. And, and there is not one single solution. You, there may be a variety of solutions depending on which part of society you are serving, which country you are in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the mere uh, important thing is that we start thinking this way. Thank you. It's nice you come from Peru. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be speaking. Uh, I'll be sending you a good chat. Uh, thank you for reaching out as well. 
Thank you, Oli. Um, we've got another question from Sebastian Valdez, author. So let's activate Sebastian's microphone. Hello. Hello. Hello to everyone. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you to Professor Oli. It was an amazing, amazing presentation. I mean, so inspiring, overwhelming. I mean, come on, the guy did an amazing presentation on one presentation only, and in speaking an hour, it's so, wow. I mean, come on. For all of us, like, we like to teach to others. It's amazingly inspiring. So, Professor Ali, thank you very much for this exposition of all of your expertise. It's really, really, really amazing. So, thank you. Now, having said that, I have a constant question that I ask myself like pretty frequently is that we all see in social media there is a lot of, of a, a group of, of colleagues that um, shows this amazing huge restoration that are, are beautiful don't, don't get me wrong they're beautiful mm -hmm. but they're huge sometimes from my point of view it's like over treatment like I see it and I, and I see there's no need for such cavitation I mean I see that tree huge cavitation, amazing, beautiful restoration, but overtreated. So what you said is that we should be focusing on treating our patients like changing their lifestyles and, and try to convince them that this is the way to treat caries. But how do we expect to change the mind of our patients if we are not even able to change the mind of our own colleagues that are still exist in this sort of cult? I mean, sorry to say it like that, like a cult, but for me it is this cult for huge, beautiful restoration, don't get me wrong, beautiful, but still, over treatment. We, we're not able to change the mind of our colleagues. How do we expect to change the mind of our patients? That they don't know the biology beneath the caries. You are quite right, Sebastian. And I, your comment is extremely pertinent. And like I said when addressing Rodrigo's um, comments, I think it's an immense task we are facing. Firstly, to change the, the uh, knowledge and attitudes, not least, of our profession. And simultaneously, go out and reach out to the population at large with messages which I think in today's access to the net uh, requires a totally different way of thinking, um, information, um, namely to make simple videos, simple uh, stories, which gradually builds up in the population an understanding and appreciation of uh, why we are changing attitudes. I agree with you. We, are, we were all brought up in my generation in making the bigger, the more beautiful uh, restorations, the better. And we were so proud when we finally finished uh, a restoration and no one asked us, is this actually relevant for this patient or could it have been solved in a much better way? Simpler, but maybe not looking as shiny and bright as the one you produced. And, but that whole at attitude you are touching upon a very important dimension of the way dentists see themselves uh, today. And that's where I think we are having an enormous challenge. And I know that many dentists uh, dislike that I'm questioning this. Absolutely, because they see it as a threat to their way of having a daily income. So yes, we are up against uh, uh, a big challenge. 
But I think that it, with the knowledge we have biologically, there's no excuse for continuing the way in which we are presently running our practices. And this is not, I would say, uh, philosophical considerations. It's actually based on the biology which we have available here and now, and we have sufficient populations to demonstrate that things can be changed and be done in a different way. So I think um, it's, it's time for action once we come out of this unpleasant uh, pandemic situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have a question away from London, from the United Kingdom, um, Nima Kazampo, um, President-elect of the Student Dental Society of Leeds College London. Let's activate Nima's microphone. Nima. Hello and a warm welcome from London. Yes, thank you very much Dr. Jozanovic and Dr. Garcia for organizing this and thank you so much Professor uh, for, for your time and your uh, thought-provoking discussions as well. Uh, in fact, I, I think you have uh, partly answered uh, some of uh, some of the question that I had uh, by uh, just now, actually. But my, my main question was uh, was rather simple. I just got, was going to ask you what advice do you have for undergraduate uh, students and newly graduated um, dentists um, with regards to how to move forward, and uh, how would you suggest um, that we unify? this sort of um, message that we want to get to them? Because uh, I know that different students from different universities, some of us across the world, have wildly different opinions on how to, how, how to treat patients, how to go forward, and how to prevent or manage caries. Um, so I would appreciate your thoughts on that. Thank you. Ooh, that's really a, a, a big question uh, in the sense that it is indeed pinpointing. Uh, what I fully appreciate uh, is the situation of you at your stage in the career. Uh, if you have the gut, um, I think it's important to join forces with friends and young colleagues around the world because we have the net to do it. In order to create a movement towards a different way of thinking dentistry. Um, just to create a movement where you get people to appreciate that the two major all diseases, like it or not, but has been caries and periodontal disease and uh, repair, etc. And if my claim is correct, that these diseases we can actually gradually cope with in different ways, in different populations, but we know it can be done and we know how to do it. Then it's due time to actually think amongst the young generation. How should we then develop our career further to serve the need of the populations we are serving. Uh, and that will of course be uh, a partly a health political um, decisions. So, so um, uh, it will strongly depend on which uh, culture you come from, which society you come from. But even within England, you know very well that there are major uh, inequalities uh, in, in the society in Britain today. And it's going to be bigger, I can promise you, when Brexit is taking place. It's, it's going to be economically uh, an even more difficult situation. Uh, and, and that alone requires 
a very different strategy for those of you who choose to focus on that part of the population which can actually not afford and which may not be as well educated as the majority of the population to even be able to fully understand the way we communicate the message. In other words, develop strategies specifically focusing on the population we are serving. But if, if that is done coordinated within and between countries of your generation, I do, be, I do believe and hope that we can rock the boat and move it further. At least I can tell you, if I can be of any assistance at high age, uh, as long as I'm able to hopefully express myself fairly properly, uh, but one never knows from day to day at this age, uh, then I'm ready to uh, support and help and do whatever I can. Um, thank you very much, Professor. I, I don't know what you're talking about with regards to age, you look pretty young to me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, Nima, for your question, thank you, Professor. And don't worry, if you need anyone to rock the boat, Nico and myself are quite uh, good rockers, um, so we'll be there to rock boats and fleets even. So, um, great. So um, let's, let's have, uh, we've got Horacio Alarcón also with a raised hand. So let's hear it from Horacio. Well, hola, bueno, buenas tardes. Hola, Horacio. Eh, quería preguntar la opinión del... Del... Hola. Quería preguntar la opinión del profesor respecto al uso del protocolo de Axelson que es un protocolo de remineralización intensiva, que son tres aplicaciones en 10 días para pacientes con alto riesgo. Ok. Um, um, Horacio Alarcón is asking you about Gracias. Axelson's protocol on remineralization. Uh, yes. Um, unfortunately, today, uh, um, there is no simple modality which to apply it for remineralization. Uh, you have to uh, apply the concept in such a way that you take advantage of elevating fluoride in the oral cavity, preferably, I think, through the toothpastes because it's so widely available and it's the only fluoride method which is actually, according to the Cochrane reviews, well documented. Uh, so, remineralization can be, it's, it's, it's not a sort of, you shouldn't think remineralization today as a black and white uh, it's not like switching on um, a contact, uh, electrical contact, and saying, now we remineralize. It's a matter of influencing the dynamic in the physiological equilibrium towards redeposition of minerals. So I don't think P.S. P. Axelson's um, original uh, thought or strategy fully is uh, applicable uh, today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Oli. Thank you, Horacio. And we have, we are going to start um, wrapping up this session and we've got one more question from Catalina Sanweza. As, um, so, oh, I'm, I'm spanglishing now. Um, uh, Cata uh, let's activate Catalina's uh, microphone. <laughs> ¿Aló? Al, hola, Catalina. Hola, voy a hacer la pregunta en español. Y si la haces despacito, yo voy traduciendo, no hay ningún problema. Ya. Yeah. Quería preguntarle al doctor, primero, ¿qué opinaba de usar el fluoruro de amino de plata 
como tratamiento para caries y, y eh, ponerlo como tratamiento de primera elección en detrimento de otros, como los que se hacen actualmente, y si habría alguna, algún elemento o algún material que se pudiera utilizar en adultos que no tuviera la complicación de la coloración. Ok. Um, gracias, Catalina. Voy a intentarlo, pero quédate en línea por si acaso. Um, uh, Catalina is asking about your views about the use of um, silver fluoride amines and um, she's referring to particularly whether there are any alternatives um, regarding the discoloration that you get with the use of these compounds. Catalina, ¿lo pregunté bien? Eh, sí, sí. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, you were saying any... Uh, uh, I didn't hear fully your translation, Diego. Um, it was the discoloration of the uh, silver-containing compounds, right? Yes, yes. Yes. Um, I know that uh, the silver containing the compounds with fluoride has become uh, very popular uh, in different parts of the world. I personally uh, do not think that uh, they are particularly uh, useful. Uh, firstly, from a toxicological point of view, I'm um, a little uh, in doubt whether it's uh, sound to have um, silver uh, in, in the, that uh, form introduced in the oral cavity. You know, just remember the debate on uh, the amalgams. Uh, there's no reason to actually repeat that, in my opinion. I think we can actually achieve a similar effect without necessarily adding um, uh, silver compounds into the um, methodologies which we have available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oli. And oh, we've got a question from Rodrigo Yagaman. So let's let's activate the microphone again. And we've got one more. Oh my God, now everybody's asking. So um, I think we're going to have to, provided you're okay, it, it's not dinner time yet in... in, uh, in oh, Denmark. it's far beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Rodrigo. He's hungry. No, very short, uh, Oli. Uh, um, we formed, we created a group here, we call it the Curiology Committee in the, in the country with several universities and we're trying to propose uh, ideas or measures to take for the country to decrease the amount of caries we have. Um, the prevalence is very high, as you know, and, and so we are worried and we created this instance to think about it and to somehow uh, play in the political arena uh, because you need to do something along those lines, not only at the individual level. And so that being said, I would like to know if you had to prioritize uh, measures to take in the country to address the prevalence of caries we have, which one would be your main measure that you would recommend us to take as a country in order to decrease the level of caries we have already? Um, firstly, I think I um, remember the group you are referring to. Uh, we met in uh, Chile when, when um, uh, we were there. Uh, so, and it was very, very uh, relevant and pertinent. Um, I would say, uh, I think there's one thing which we have been failing to do, and that is we have not done sufficient to attack the sugar consumption in society. I really think that um, the dental profession has failed when it comes to sugars. I think we can explain today why this happened. As you um, probably know, uh, Rodrigo, um, the International Sugar Foundation influenced 
um, the decisions of the National Cares Program in US, when that program's uh, strategy was laid out, I didn't. I don't think very many people realized this before a few years ago, when an excellent. Uh, scientific report came out uh, from a group who had been going through all the correspondence back in the 1960s to the early 70s uh, and showed that 78% of all the text in the strategy document of the National Caries Program created at the time by the national health uh, system of the US were actually written by people from the national international sugar foundations. In other words, it was a lobbying activity, which is comparable to what we have seen from the tobacco industry uh, in, in, uh, for many years. And that we have been, in a way, ignoring. It was a disaster to the National Cares Program. And as we see today, uh, it had no effect on the situation in the US. Uh, NIH invested a tremendous amount of efforts into the National Cares Program. It gave a lot of interesting results, but it had no effect on dental carriers in the US. So if we are today going to choose another strategy, I would say uh, go for the pattern of sugar consumption. I know it's difficult. I know it's complicated to get children to stop drinking or swimming in Coca-Cola is not easy. It's not easy. Uh, I've had great problems with my own kids when they were growing up uh, to stop the misuse. But it's fantastic when you walk around in a, a young generation of um, uh, students to see how they are taking it as a very natural thing to have just uh, extremely sugar containing um, soft drinks available. I can tell you the story that when I took over as head of the medical um, faculties uh, department of anatomy um, years back, some years back, it was actually uh, 2007, I um, realized that all over in that big institute, there were um, automatic uh, devices standing where you could pull soft drinks, preferably Coca-Cola. And I took the decision, uh, totally without support at the time from the, uh, the Dean of Medical Studies and forbid any sort of uh, this type of machinery within our huge department and instead install water, pure clean water and nothing but. And I remember the students got totally uh, upset until we had a meeting. And I told them uh, what sort of influence they were under. And suddenly everything solved out and they stopped, uh, at least the medical students, uh, boozing in Coca-Cola. In other words, coming back to your question, I think I would develop a strategy in your group on how do we interfere with the misuse of sugars in society. Uh, it requires a uh, I think a broader uh, group than just uh, cariology, 
but it's, it's equally important from the point of view of obesity in society and diabetes in society. And for that reason, let's join forces with our colleagues there so that we can make a sort of a mutual coordinated effort in reducing sugar in, in the consumption in the population. I can tell you, I just last week received data from Norway showing that in the last 10 years, they have managed in society to reduce sugar consumption on average per capita with 50% in Norway. And um, it's probably uh, one of the major explanations for the dramatic uh, uh, reduction in uh, dental caries um, in Norway. So I think go for that dimension because it's the one and single measure which I think we are ignoring. Thank you, Professor Rodrigo. Thank you. Um, I know um, how keen Rodrigo is about diet and sugar-free diet. So, um, you know, uh, I, I totally, I can see the, uh, the, you know, perhaps the controversy raised the of uh, sent for the machine to be taken away and all the lovely sugar not rushing Ooh. students, uh, you know, um, you know, bloodstream, but you know, you were doing them a great favor in the long run. So uh, good for you. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got three more questions and unfortunately that's all the time we're gonna have, uh, you know, the space we're gonna have. So let's cover um, William's question. Hi, William. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Good, good. I uh, just wanted to start by saying, Mang Tak, all the mind for San Ting, or her, so I mean, student. Uh, going on to my um, question, it's uh, concerning cosmetic work that you were talking about earlier. In that, in the public, in the general public, there are more and more people who want uh, what we can say unreasonable cosmetic work to their teeth, deemed as unnecessary. In cases like that, if you have patients like that as a dentist, um, should you try and discourage them from it, um, turn them away, or what's the best way of dealing with it? Who? Uh, that's a nasty one, uh, William. I, I realized that you were speaking uh, Danish. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm Danish myself. You're Dane? Yeah, Living from Aarhus. In, from Aarhus. Good Lord. Yeah. Interesting. I can't see. I, I can't see your face, uh, unfortunately. Um, have you been? Have you been so unlucky to have me as a teacher? Uh, no, I, 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 I haven't. Um, I am in uh, King's College in London. Okay. Okay. You're lucky. <laughs> uh, well, let me answer uh, your your uh, um, question. Um, uh, uh, let me see, do I, please re repeat, just give me a keyword um, again. You were saying, William, there you are, yeah, yes. I was, yes, um, as a dentist, if you have like oh, a yeah. patient. Cosmetics, yes, yes, I got it, I got it. Yes, you see, you're pinpointing um, one of the major problems because Dentists are earning a lot of money doing cosmetics and cosmetics have nothing to do with healthcare, in my opinion. Of course, there are rare cases where it's justified to do a combined cosmetic treatment, but to have a, 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 pr a praxis based on producing cosmetics, uh, I think is, is um, a very unfortunate development. But I realize that that's what you are facing in most of South America, because there are so many dentists and you have created a need 
for cosmetic treatment in society, which is shocking to me. And it's of course not only in uh, dentistry, but also in, in many other aspects uh, of uh, society that you create a need in the population for treatment, orthodontics, for example, which is basically not needed from a functional point of view. But if you convince young, not least girls, that uh, they would be more beautiful, more handsome by having their teeth regulated, um, you are up against strong forces uh, I can only say that uh, I would hope that the dental profession can distinguish in the future between need for health care and other functions. But uh, it's, um, it's a major problem. I fully accept that, David. Thank you. Thank you, very much. Thank you William. And, uh, you know, Greetings all the way back to London, and thank you, uh -huh. uh, Professor Feyerskov, as well. And we have two more questions. We've got Daniel Olavarria. Daniel, let's hear it from you. We can't hear, we can hear you now. Okay. Now we can. Um, yes, well, um, first of all, uh, thank you to Dr. Ole. Nice to meet you. It is a great uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to ask you something because I really never imagined that I could have this opportunity. And thank you so much for your presentation that was so headed to young dentists and uh, uh, to young students. I'm part of that group. I'm still uh, a dental school student. So um, uh, now that uh, we have that fluoride acts in a more um, uh, metabolic activity, activity way, uh, what do you think about the use of fluoride in a topical mode, uh, for example, as a varnish? Um, and I mean about the schemes that we have uh, talked uh, to use for so, for so long that uh, are um, you know um, uh, you know directed to uh, for example to use it in in according to the carries risk of the patients. What do you think about that schemes? Uh, and if there's any, uh, what would be the more reliable? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Um, uh, highly relevant, uh, absolutely. Um, the problem is uh, the mechanisms of action are the same um, concerning fluoride. It's released from, as you know, from the varnishes. Um, the problem I have with advocating varnishes is that it's too costly. It's, it's um, a smart way of industry to earn more money. And in particular, in some of the countries where they have even persuaded the Ministry of Health to introduce varnishes as a sort of standard treatment for children, you can imagine what sort of income they are generating. Um, and my uh, uh, comment to that is, uh, it can be, you can achieve the same caries reduction in children populations with much simpler methods and much, much cheaper. And, and um, but of course, that's uh, not in the interest of the manufacturers. We are up against market forces, again, like the sugar, which is quite powerful. Great. Daniel, thank you. 
Thank you very much, um, Daniel. Um, Daniel, I'm just going to activate your microphone. Where were you calling us from? Let's activate your microphone, um, Daniel. Where, where were you calling us from? In Chile? You're in Chile? Yes. Okay. We, we, we're not too far, maybe even in Santiago. So great, great, great question. Thank you. Thank yes, you. Yes, I'm from Chile. Great. What part? Yes, thank you so much. Okay, brilliant. You got to ask thank your you. idol, so that's great. Well done. Um, we've got one last question from Valentina. Um, let's activate Valentina's microphone. Oh, there she is. Hola, hola a todos. Eh, quisiera hacer una pregunta, la voy a hacer en español. Eh, me gustaría saber qué opina del de uso de una pasta dental en base a plantas medicinales sin flúor y recomendarla a otras personas. Citando que dijo que al final el flúor detiene y no previene la enfermedad. Ok. Gracias. Ok, voy a tratar, quédate en línea Valentina. Uh, Valentina is asking, what do you think about the use of dental toothpastes, uh, plant-based toothpastes, um, um, free of fluoride, based on the um, premise you, 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 you uh, uh, presented on the fact that fluoride doesn't actually, uh, dijiste prevenir, ¿no? No, eh, no detiene, eh, no detiene. Detiene, no previene. Ah, it stops, but it doesn't prevent. Based on the premise that fluoride stops, but doesn't prevent, as you, uh, as you mentioned. I'm, I'm translating literally the question, basically. Yes. Um, uh, Valentina, if I understand you correctly, um, uh, fluoride does not stop. Uh, it, it should be added to toothpastes we are recommending because it elevates at least if people brush teeth twice a day it elevates the fluoride level in all fluids and that's the important message um, so so if i understood you correctly um, uh, you were suggesting plant-based uh, toothpastes uh, si hecha en la casa a través de plantas medicinales, okay. que una persona pueda preparárselo en su casa. Ok, um, what, what Valentina is mentioning is, what about a toothpaste, homemade, based on medicinal plants, that, you, you know, people, ordinary people can actually make from their homes? Uh, yeah, un unfortunately, um, it would not contain fluoride in the amounts which... Uh, are absolutely needed to, to uh, interfere with the derenalization processes in the biofilm. Uh, so so um, to make their own uh, dentifrices, although it would be appealing economically, but, but um, uh, I think we have to, to um, have commercial um, fluoride contain toothpastes uh, available, uh, hopefully to uh, cheaper prices than what we are having at the moment, because it, it's an enormous income. But um, I see no other solution. You have to have that fluoride made available regularly as part of the patient's daily routine. Thank you, Professor Feyerskov, and thank you, Valentina, for your question, which I'm sure um, is something that we must have all, I include myself, faced during our um, practicing clinical um, lives. And um, I wanted to take this opportunity to thank all our guests. We've got, you know, just under 150 people still with us. and. Before you guys go, let me just remind you in the chat, there's a link for a raffle. We're not going to do the raffle now, but we've got four 
very nice prices from some of our sponsors and it's your opportunity to participate go and fill in the link i'm sure my colleague dr garcia can copy it and repost it now um, in the chat um, so you have an opportunity and we'll be announcing we'll be doing the um the raffle later and announcing later tonight um, on our instagram account the results i also wanted to remind you to check the link in the chat for the references um, which professor Feyerskov has very kindly provided us with. Um, it's a PDF, you can download it and then go and find the, the papers if you want to read further. And finally, as many of you know, this is our 60th webinar. We started off doing some webinars on the 15th of April when you know COVID had struck Chile. And um, this is our 60th, it's Teacher's Day in Chile and we've got an amazing um, speaker as well to celebrate. So we'd like to invite whoever is available um, before closing the webinar um, to stay online, turn on the cameras so we can take a few pictures because also this is being recorded and your your camera, your, your, your photo will be recorded also in the stream. So great to see Kena Ortiz from the South, my colleague. Um, lots of love and Vicente Arangis. Now, now I can see you were all there all the time. Okay, um, so that's that's for me. I just want to give um, uh, Oli. I want to uh, thank you on behalf of the faculty and also on behalf of Esperanza Villasante, who couldn't be um, with us um, uh, for most of the um, of the of the presentation. But um, I want to give the microphone to Nicolas before wrapping up. Um, so he can thank you as well, because I know he wanted to say a few words. Nico. Professor, Professor, thank you very much for this incredible and thought-provoking presentation. Um, I'm sure that all the people here are very happy and grateful for all reflections that you shared here. Um, this was your first uh, webinar, and we are so grateful to have been part of this event. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Professor. Muchísimas gracias también a todos los participantes por estar aquí con nosotros. Y vamos a por la foto para que podamos compartirla en nuestras redes sociales. Yay, let's go for the photo. Let's see if we can get everybody to turn on. Let's see, hopefully, Angela Tamayo can also on my screen, Sebastián Valdés. I don't know if you guys can also turn your... Um, uh, your cameras on, but I'll be taking some shots. So everybody smile on camera. We'll be taking some of the screens because we've got six screens as well. So there we are. Three, two, one. Big smile, everyone. And let's do another one. We, we, I'm going to be doing six of them. Okay. So, okay. Three, two, one. Smile. Okay. Great. Uh, someone, Sergio Gonzalez, greetings. You're driving. Be careful. Okay. <laughs> And may, I, may I take the advantage, Diego, to, to thank all of you whom I haven't been able to see or except for a few faces, which was very, very nice. Thank you for this initiative. I have enjoyed it thoroughly. And I must admit, after um, Rodrigo's kind invitation for wines, I will come back as soon as is possible. So uh, looking forward, hopefully one day, to see all of you uh, in real life. And thank you very much for today. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I know everybody is uploading from home. And before you all go, I just want to tell you, um, next week, we're going we're gonna to have a competition for one of these babies. So I'm sure many of you have it, but, you know, not a signed copy, unfortunately. But we, you can fly yourselves all the way to Denmark or when Professor comes here and get it signed. But we're going to be, um, you know, uh, having a raffle for one of these. Um, follow our, net, our social media and out about the possibility of getting one of these for yourselves. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much, everybody. And good night, good afternoon. Good night.